Welcome to the Nathan Nephew Show. I am, of course, Nathan Nephew. You might know me as Nate from Mad Odds with Nate and Brian. Show that currently we're doing live on Tuesdays. Probably going to switch to Thursdays very soon, but we'll let you know. You can find that one over at oddshow.com. This show, of course, broadcast right here on Red State Talk Radio, also available. This show and past shows, NathanNephew.com. Send me an email, talk at NathanNephew.com if you want want to give me any comments, any feedback, any criticism. Just want to say hi, whatever. Talk at NathanNephew.com is how you can get a hold of me. There's also uh, soon to be a contact form on NathanNephew.com, so you can you can go there and just click contact. It makes it easy. You don't have to remember my email address. You just have to remember my name, which uh, <laughs> for some people is easier than others, but that's not always a good thing. So the 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 White House was uh, the West Wing was actually evacuated today due to smoke, and this was interesting. It reminded me something that I hadn't you hadn't thought of for a while, and that that was. How much our president, Barack Hussein Obama, has actually smoked in his life? I think a lot of people don't even know that he's a smoker. And I mean, I've heard rumors that he's quit. Has he? Has he not? I don't know. But when he took office, he was definitely a cigarette smoker. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. I mean, look, the the, the, the one brother, the Sarnab brother that uh, responsible for the bombings in Boston, you know, he was caught largely because uh, someone wanted to go outside and have a smoke, and they noticed something something askew in their backyard, you know, blood on their boat. Something they didn't put there. It wasn't their blood, so, you know, they called the police like they should have. Uh, so, uh, you know, smoking does some good. And uh, nicotine, you know, has been shown to uh, reduce the, the chances of, of Alzheimer's. So there's there's actually health benefits to smoking. You know, it's not all that bad. I mean, sure. It's probably not the most healthy thing you can do. It's probably not the best for you. Uh, but, but you know, you, that's that's the thing about freedom is you don't always have to make the right choice, but you are always allowed to make that choice. Unfortunately, we're, we're not uh, everywhere in places you know, like New York. It's very hard to smoke. Even in Michigan, where, Michigan, where I'm from, uh, you can't smoke in a bar. So that's like a double whammy. You're not allowed to smoke in there, but also the bar owner who owns... The bar, it's their business, private property. They're not allowed to let you smoke on their property, at least inside where they're serving food and drinks. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, bar owners get around that with, with outdoor areas, some covered, some heated is kind of an iffy thing. And, and there's really no enforcement mechanism. Excuse me, I'm, uh, <clears throat> been battling a, 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 a pretty nasty cold and, and some sickness and, over the last week, and I'm really not enjoying it, but, you know, we just move on, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Everybody gets sick, you, you you deal with it, you get over it, take some medicine maybe, maybe not. I've opted to take medicine, but I often forget to take it until, you know, it's it's uh, too late and I'm already recording a radio show, so. <laughs> and here we are, and unfortunately, you uh, you guys have to hear the effects of that. But yeah, the first thing, the first thing I, th- I thought when I heard that the White House West Wing was evacuated was, I bet Obama left a cigarette lit, you know, and it started a fire or something. But I, it, it was apparently an equipment malfunction, whatever that means. I don't know which equipment, what it was. It may have been the ashtray. It may have malfunctioned. But one of the most, oh, boy, what am I going to say, upsetting but not surprising things that I've heard this whole week was the IRS come out Friday, yesterday, and apologize for the inappropriate targeting of conservative groups. So the groups that were applying for for nonprofit status, federal nonprofit status, they singled out about seventy five organizations. They had the words Tea Party or Patriot in their applications, their tax exempt applications. Nine twelve group Glenn Beck stuff. I mean, all of this. So Patriot, and originally we heard that this, you know, this wasn't wasn't known at a high level. This started with low level agents, rogue agents. They they took it upon themselves to to do this. The higher ups had no insight. They didn't know what was happening. Then in a report, a draft of a report that came out from the inspector general, we find out that well maybe the higher ups knew in 2011, and they came out and apologized for things happening during the 2012 election. So that would be around the same time frame. And it turns out people at a higher level did know. In fact, maybe the head of the division 
that oversees tax exempt groups knew that it was going on. Now we do have evidence that says they said to cease this action immediately, but it might have taken a little while for that to actually take effect and for them to stop singling out these groups. I mean, some of these questions are just ridiculous, asking about family, political affiliations, social media, you know, what what campaigns you've been involved in, things like this that, that really, really have no business in a tax structure, you know, process at all. I mean, who cares? It's not the IRS's business what groups you've been affiliated, what you've done on Twitter. But of course we know, I mean, that's... I. I guess maybe that's the benefit of being an incumbent president when you're running is that you have small little campaign tools like the IRS that you can use. Now, yeah, I'm not saying that Obama really had any, you know, any hand in this at all, but it's just it's not surprising that conservative groups were being targeted. It's it's it make it, it, you know, it makes me really angry, but it's not surprising. So we'll see where this goes. You know, there's an investigation into it. They've apologized, so that makes everything better, right? But we'll see where it goes. Unfortunately, the gun control debate is not going away. I have a clip here. It's a it's a pretty awesome uh, uh, open open mic situation that that a lot of people get caught in. And I'm I'm trying to teach Brian this that anytime there's a microphone around you, assume that it's on. Because if you think it's off and start saying things that you wouldn't normally want to be recorded and posted on the internet, you're going to get caught eventually, and you're going to say something, and it's going to be a live microphone, and you really can't take it back. This was after a a New Jersey Senate uh, um, gathering. I assume they thought the mics were off. It's really bad quality, but if you listen, you'll see one of them calling for legislation that confiscates, confiscates, confiscates. And the other one's talking about, oh, they just want to hold on to their little gun and do with it whatever they want. Well, you know, I mean, if that's why I want a gun, that's fine. But I don't think that is why the majority of gun owners have them. But intent really doesn't matter when it comes to that pesky little amendment to the United States Constitution. Which, incidentally, I have sitting right next to me. Oh, and it's right here on my mouse pad, so interesting but uh here here is the extracurricular chatter after uh the the new jersey senate was uh, uh adjourned we made some bills better i know we couldn't make everybody happy but we did what we could to uh, at least improve the process thank you we will see everybody back on the budget cycle next week They don't care about the bad guys. All they want to do is to have their little guns and do whatever they want. That's the line they have developed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is the line we've developed, is that we want to have our little guns and our big guns and do what we want with them. I mean, see, murder's illegal, hmm, assault's illegal, robbery's illegal, carjacking's illegal. So, yeah, I no, I, uh, outside of those things that are already illegal uh, separately, I, I want to be able to do anything I want with my gun. And I don't, I don't think that's so crazy because... Like I said, it is kind of enshrined in our Constitution and our history, which, to me, is very important. To people like this, it's not so much. Uh, that brings up another article I found in the Christian Science Monitor. Basically, they, they, they were responding to a survey where 56% of respondents said that they believe that gun violence has actually increased over the last 20 years, and we know that's not true. Only 12% think that gun violence has decreased over the last 20 years. And it has decreased dramatically. But what what they're saying in this article is, well, people arm themselves to protect against gun violence. I mean, right? So you have a gun to protect somebody from a gun harming you or your family. But if gun violence is going down, then what are you really arming for? You're arming, you're arming for, uh, you know, something that's not, not really tangible. 
an imagined threat is actually with gun violence down is america arming against an imagined threat well no of of, of course there are people who arm themselves to protect them the you know to to be protected from other individuals myself included also you arm yourself to be protected from a government or from you know foreign or united states government if the need be hopefully it won't and i don't think it will but that's that's why you arm yourself and just because gun violence is going down don't you think that maybe gun violence is going down because there are more people arming themselves so what we should stop doing it and see what happens with gun violence i mean is it is this an experiment or is this just something to me it's not an experiment we'll take a quick break we'll be right back Obama wants your money, and he's determined to get it. He wants your money to buy up unions, his Wall Street cronies, and to expand the Obama welfare nation. Well, Swiss America is determined to stop him from stealing your money. They want to send you an award-winning film, I Want Your Money, on DVD that exposes his plan. It'll help keep the government's hands off your money using gold, silver, and other hard asset strategies to protect your hard-earned money. Call today and request the DVD, I Want Your Money, normally $19.95, yours absolutely free. Let Swiss America show you how to use gold, silver, and other hard assets to protect your hard-earned money. Call now, 800-932-5146, 800-932-5146. Call Swiss America right now. Learn all about investing in gold, 800-932-5146, 800-932-5146. Call now. Red State Talk Radio. Conservatism, Red State Style. Welcome back to the Nathan Nephew Show. I am, of course, Nathan Nephew. You can obviously hear the show right here on Red State Talk Radio. Also, listen to this show and past shows over on NathanNephew.com. Email address, once again, talk at NathanNephew.com. All right, so uh, we, we, we've heard all sorts of stories of, of 911 operators, you know, uh, not really living up to their expectations that they have while on the job. Uh, you know, I mean, sometimes they don't believe the caller. Sometimes they fall asleep. We've heard that, you know, calls being answered automatically and they're sleeping. Um, we have a couple cases recently that, that are interesting. First, the, the Amanda Berry, her called 911 when she escaped from Ariel Castro's house in Cleveland. Uh, of course, she's one of the three women that, you know, that were missing, have been missing for 10 years or so, some longer, some less, and were kept in Ariel Castro's house in a, a neighborhood with, with nobody knowing. Of course, Amanda Berry having a, a, a child while she was there. And, you know, she got free, went, went to the neighbor's house and called, called the police. And there's some question on whether the dispatcher actually handled the call correctly. Let's listen to the call and then we can discuss that a bit. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. 2207 Seymour. It looks like you're calling me from 2210. It looks like you're calling me from 2210. I can't hear you. It looks like you were calling me from 2210, Seymour. I'm across the street. I'm using the phone. Okay, stay there with those neighbors. Talk to the police. Who's the guy you're, uh, who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. Alright, how old is he? 
Oh, he's like 52. <laughs> All right, and uh, Steven, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been on the news for the last 10 years. Okay, I got, I got that here. I already. <laughs> and uh, you said what was his name again? Uh, Ariel Castro. And is he white, black, or Hispanic? I'm Hispanic. And what's he wearing? I don't know because he's not here right now. That's when, he he left, away. When, when he left, what was he wearing? It's a pity. What? Like the police are on the way. Talk to them okay. when they get there. Okay. Uh, I need. Okay. I told you they're on the way. Talk to them when they get there. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So the question is, why? did the dispatcher handle the call with such indifference? I mean, it seems like, and I think we found out it's, it's a, he, it's not, it's not clear from the recording, but, uh, I, I think it is a man, uh, the dispatcher, Amanda Berry call says, I've been missing for 10 years. I escaped. And the dispatcher just says, okay, talk to the police when they get there. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, the first thing that you notice is they said, well, we'll send a car when it's available. Now we know that they did apparently respond within two minutes, which is remarkable for a, a, a response by the police. I mean, that's a great response time. Uh, it won't help you in a, in a break-in or an active shooting or something, so you still obviously, I mean, you look and you see how fast they responded in two minutes. That's way too long if something's happening where you, you are in imminent danger. Uh, you know, I mean, and that's the argument for arming yourself and, and being prepared to defend yourself. But anyway, that's that's a whole other topic. This dispatcher didn't really, you know, I mean, of course they don't want to get involved emotionally, but kept saying, no, I know, I know who you are, just talk to the police when they get there, and then hung up. I mean, that that kind of surprised me that the dispatcher didn't stay on the phone until the police arrived. I think the dispatcher did get the information he needed and hopefully went on to pass it on to whoever did. Obviously, they must have done the right thing because the police responded so quickly. So I don't know what you think about that. Send me an email, talk at Nathan Nephew Show, or at NathanNephew.com, and uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. When I first heard it, I was surprised at the way it was handled and surprised that the dispatcher didn't stay on the phone. Next case we have, though, is a, a Korean who owns a convenience store that was just robbed. He apparently sees it from his office, comes out, shoots the suspects, and then calls 911. It takes 911, or the police, an hour, over an hour to get there. In fact, he waited for 20 minutes and then went home. They got there, called him from home, and made him come back, and he wasn't very happy, understandably so, because he doesn't really need them there now. What are they going to do? Take a description of the suspects and go find them. So, I mean, you know, why wake him up, right? Let's listen to the call. They said they didn't do that because they couldn't understand the man. So, I mean, understandably, the dispatcher couldn't understand the caller very well. Uh, but I don't know that if you don't understand what's going on, obviously the guy's excited about something. You just say, all right, calls in the police, hang up, and then put it as such a priority that it takes over an hour for the police to respond. And this man had just come out of his office and shot somebody that was in his store with a gun. It takes an hour. He waited 20 minutes and went home. And they said they never heard that he said shoot or shot in the call. And I can understand that, but if you don't understand the situation, you have an excited man calling you, don't you think you would send somebody a little quicker than an hour? I mean, contrast that with Amanda Berry's phone call in Cleveland where it took two minutes for the police to show up, minute and a half, whatever it was, under two minutes, which is remarkable. But, man, I 
this really just underscores the point that you need to be able to take care of yourself. Luckily, this man did. Situation was over. The suspects ran. He was safe. I mean, they may come back, but, you know, at that time when he called 911, he'd already handled the situation, basically called them to come get a report and, and look for the suspects. All right, so the Benghazi hearings were, were this week, which were great. I was, I was actually homesick the day that they were, um, legitimately sick. And, you know, being who I am, I thought it would be fun to watch C-SPAN all day, which I did because the hearings were from like 11.30 or noon to 5.30 or something. Uh, they were long hearings and, and, and the witnesses, I mean, the, the whistleblowers did, did great, I think. And a lot of new information did come out. And of course, it was politicized by the Democrats, blaming Republicans for cutting spending, which they blame, you know, I mean, nothing like the sequester, but, you know, they, they cut spending. And so the, the embassy or the consulate or whatever you want to call it now in Benghazi was attacked because of the Republicans. But of course, we knew that was coming. The Republicans, though, I mean, did get some good answers. Trey Gowdy has been great on this issue, uh, from South Carolina, I believe. He, he, you know, he asks pointed questions. He seems to really understand what's going on. He wants to get to the root of the, of the, you know, of the problem. Was it a cover up? Was there a stand down order? You know, really, what's the deal? He read an email, an unclassified email that hasn't been released. He made a good point about bipartisanship that the Democrats are always calling for, saying that, oh, this is bipartisan. We just want the information. Mr. Hicks, who is Beth Jones? Beth Jones is the acting assistant secretary for Near Eastern Affairs. At the State Department. I want to read an excerpt from an email she sent, and you were copied on it. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, for our colleagues who like to trumpet bipartisanship, this would be a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate it. Some of these emails, even though they're not classified, have not been released, Mr. Chairman, including the one that I'm going to read from. So for my colleagues who trumpet bipartisanship, this would be a wonderful time to prove it. This is from Ms. Jones to you to counsel for Hillary Clinton, to Victoria Newland, to Mr. Kennedy, near as I can tell to almost everyone in the State Department, and I'm going to read from it. I spoke to the Libyan ambassador and emphasized the importance of Libyan leaders continuing to make strong statements. By the way, Mr. Hicks, this email was sent on September the 12th, the day after Benghazi, and several days before Ambassador Rice's television appearance. And I'll continue. When he said his government suspected that former Gaddafi regime elements carried out the attacks, I told him that the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic terrorists. Let me say that again, Mr. Hicks. She told him, the State Department, on September the 12th, days before our ambassador went on national television, is telling the ambassador to Libya, the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic terrorists. Whoa. I mean, to me, that seems pretty damning. We had September 12th, the day after the attacks in Benghazi, we had a ranking official send an email to a Libyan ambassador that says, no, it was Ansar al-Sharia who 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 committed these terrorist attacks. And then almost a week later uh, on Sunday, Susan Rice goes on five different shows and says, "No, nah, it was it was a YouTube video obviously." And completely contradicts the Libyan president who says it was a terrorist attack, which we find out delayed the response of the FBI because obviously Libya was upset that the United States just contradicted them, made them look like idiots, and he wouldn't grant access to to the FBI to get in there to do their investigation. Now, I'm sure it's pretty obvious what happens to a crime scene the longer it sits unsecured. But this email, I mean, it comes out on the 12th, the day after. Obviously, people in the State Department knew this was a terrorist attack. So why was it covered up and, and who made that decision? I hope we get that answer. We also found out, since we've been told over and over again that there was never an order to stand down, nobody was told, do not go help, that... Gregory Hicks was in the presence of the stand-down order. He doesn't know who made the order, but he was with the team when their leader was told, no, do not send them, keep them where they are in Tripoli. Now, unfortunately, 
Hicks was a bit preoccupied with other things, so he didn't ask, hey, who made that order? He just went on and found another way to help and and, and, and was very heroic. I mean, all three of these whistleblowers were, were great. It was very emotional testimony, great testimony. Got some good information, you know, reinforced some other information, and I'm hoping we get to talk to Susan Rice. I hope I hope there's a hearing with Susan Rice, uh, you know, and and and, and uh, what, the lawyer with representing some of these whistleblowers says that he has more clients that want to testify. I think they're afraid, though. I mean, Gregory Hicks was more or less demoted. You know, he has a fairly low position compared to where he was when he was working in Libya. You know, so there's no wonder that, that there is some concern of speaking up because there will be repercussions. Now, the Democrats did say that they, they have their back. They'll protect them. You let us know if you, uh, happen to, you know, have any, have any, uh, repercussions or, or any, uh, backlash from testifying. So we'll see if they follow through. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, I'm running out of time here. Remember to check out the show on NathanNephew.com and stay tuned in right here to Red State Talk Radio. See you next week.